Good evening, everyone. I'm Joel Whitney. It's a pleasure to be here with you all tonight um, for a talk about Lenape Hoking and the tenacious myth of the purchase of Manhattan. Um, I'm gonna introduce our guests of honor in a moment, but to give you a sample of what we're gonna be talking about, imagine for a second that you bought a house uh, and only later found out that the previous owner only printed a deed in times where rules about these things were, let's say more lax. Uh, you finally thought to examine the deed hundreds of years later, you learned that the seller was never named, the proper date was pretty rough, and the buyer too, the one you bought it from, was not named in the so-called deed, would you sue? Uh, this is a terrible, but kind of approximate analogy for what we're here to discuss tonight. Um, as I say, I'm Joel Whitney, and I'm pleased to be presenting this with the Lenape Center and the Center for Brooklyn History. The myth that we're gonna discuss holds that the Dutch settlers purchased the island of Manahata from native savages for $24 worth of beads and trinkets. Um, it's been enabled by Western historians and um, artists for centuries, this, this inaccurate and pernicious story. And as one panelist notes, it's a weaponized narrative by its implied justification of the genocide and forced removal of the Lenape. Our, our speakers are here to explain the true history, um, setting straight this near universal misrepresentation. They'll discuss this falsehood and how it's perpetuated prejudices, fed injustice and served the interests of settler, settler colonists and the United States government. Um, and I'll say also that uh, we're gonna have a conversation and then immediately after this first uh, significant chunk of the conversation, we're gonna show a film uh, called Back to Manhattan, Manhattan rather. Um, before uh, I introduce our panelists, I'll add that we'll, we'll, we'll show the film. We'll have a little bit more of a conversation after the film and we'll bring you in. And if you have questions, you should put them in the Q&A function on this webinar. Um, I'm going to introduce uh, Joe Baker first. We'll put the rest of uh, these bios in the chat as we go, but Joe Baker is an artist, educator, curator, and activist who has been working in the field of native arts for the past 30 years. He's an old, enrolled member of the Delaware Tribe of Indians of Oklahoma and co-founder, executive director of Lenape Center in Manhattan. Uh, Joe is an adjunct professor at Columbia University School of Social Work in New York and was recently visiting professor of museum studies at Colorado College, uh, Colorado Springs, Colorado. He serves as a board member for the Endangered Language Fund, Yale University, and on the advisory committee for the National Public Art Consortium, New York, and cultural advisor for the CBS series, Ghosts. Uh, Adrian Kumans is co-founder and co-director of Lenape Center and an adopted member of the White Turkey Fugate family. Mary Catherine Nagel is an enrolled citizen of the Cher Cherokee Nation. She's also, uh, I don't think that's true anymore, um, she works to protect tribal sovereignty and the inherent right of Indian nations to protect their women and children from domestic violence and sexual assault. From 2015 to 2019, she served as the first executive director of the Yale Indigenous Performing Arts Program. Nagel is an alum of the 2013 Public Theater Emerging Writers Program. Productions include Miss Lead, Amer Amerindia, Fairly Traceable, Sovereignty, Manahata, Return to Niobrara, and Crossing Minosi uh, Sovereignty and Manahata. Uh, she has received commissions from Arena Stage, the Rose Theater, Portland Center Stage, Denver Center for the Performing Arts, Yale Repertory Theater, Roundhouse Theater, and Oregon Shakespeare Theater. And um, as the conversation uh, moves to the film, the film will be introduced by Stuart Huntington, a filmmaker and reporter for Indian Country Today, whose work explores the cultural, jurisdictional, and economic borderlands between Indian Country and broader US communities. His current project examines the rise of the San Manuel Band of Mission Indians from near extermination in 1866 at the hands of a California state finance militia to major 21st century economic and philanthropic presence in Southern California's Inland Empire. So please welcome our panel, and we'll start, I think, with a welcome to Lenape Hoking from Joe Baker, and thanks to all of you for being here. Good evening, everyone. I'm, uh, as, as introduced, I am Joe Baker, an enrolled member of the Delaware Tribe of Indians from Oklahoma. I'm, I'm coming to you this evening from Manhattan, uh, the ancestral homeland of the Lenape, 
Uh, I am so pleased to share this screen with everyone, the esteemed panelists tonight, and to really dive deep into this conversation uh, about the uh, mythical purchase of Manhattan. Um, I love the word tenacious. And, and you know, from my, my perspective, this myth has, has been going on now for 400 years. So, so let's, let's explore what's really behind this, this kind of hold and story that we, we keep hearing and remunerating uh, in our minds and psyche. Um, and that tonight will be our discussion. So welcome. Mute. Uh, good evening, everyone. Thank you so much, Joe, for that welcome. And, and thank you, Joel, for all the introduction. So it is my honor tonight to moderate this discussion with uh, these two incredible gentlemen that I have known now for, for many years, actually, um, doesn't feel like that long, but, um, and, you know, we've, we've known each other in different capacities and, and worked together in different ways, but, um, you know, there's a lot to be said about the myth of the purchase of Manhattan, but one of the things that, you know, strikes me about the myth, um, a lot of people understand this story of, you know, how the land was purchased from the Indians. Many people living on Manhattan Island are familiar with that part of the story, but up until very recently, I mean, I think it's easy to forget, um, I think COVID has you know, affected us all, traumatized many people. Um, and I think, you know, but before COVID, before the murder of George Floyd, before there was sort of an awakening in this country, I, I would say a, a raising of consciousness that has occurred and not to say that we're all the way there yet, but um, in terms of progress and, and solving issues, but we're starting to see a lot of institutions do land acknowledgements. People are starting, you know, theaters, universities, you name the institution, they now want to name the Lenape in their land acknowledgement. But if you go back even just five years, most people living on the island of Manhattan did not know that Manhattan was a Lenape word, and that's why they were living on the island of Manhattan. And you two gentlemen, along with um, Curtis Zuniga, who's actually not here with us tonight, uh, started the Lenape Center um, on Manhattan Island. And I, I would just love to hear from both of your perspectives, what has that journey been to, to bring the Lenape back. And of course, I know that's sort of a myth too, because it's not like, yes, everyone was forcibly removed, but you know, you've got individuals like Harold Pruner from the Delaware Nation who came back and worked on Wall Street in the 80s. And you know, it's it, the Delaware Lenape were not completely erased from the face of the earth, right? You all are still here today. And so, you know, there's really what we're talking about, right, is a lot of erasure. There's sort of the miseducation of the myth, but then there's also the complete erasure of any Lenape. Um, of any idea that the Lenape were here, that this was their homeland, their, their nation, their, their territory, and that everyone is still here today and actually should be honored and recognized. And so I'd love to hear Joe and Hadrian, you know, sort of how that led you to start the Lenape Center and, and what, how does the Lenape Center interface with the, the erasure, uh, you know, physically on the land with the people living there today? Okay, thank you, Mary Kay. I, you know, Lenape Center, uh, the inspiration for Lenape Center really was given voice by tribal elder Nora Thompson Dean, who, like Harold Pruner, um, was was visiting. She she just was visiting the homeland in the 1970s, a traditional woman, a fluent speaker, but she was here upon invitation of primarily universities and colleges uh, and anthropologists to really speak about the uh, ancestry, our, our presence in Lenape Hoking. But what I had realized, my first visit to uh, Manhattan was uh, in 1978. And over the years coming back, it was apparent to me that this truth of our history was missing from the public psyche. And it, it seemed to me there was an urgency here that we must do something to correct that, uh, to correct and push back against that erasure. And as a result, 
uh, we came up with the idea of creating the nonprofit uh, Lenape Center in 2009. And that's been our mission uh, and our focus uh, for these 12, 13 years that we've been working within the city and greater area uh, territory of Lenape Hoking. Adrian. Well, thank you, Joe. And thank you, MK. It's an honor to be here uh, with you this evening. Um, along with that erasure also came the narrative of this purchase of Manhattan that it gave a, um, a sort of context by which it um, absolved of responsibility because of somehow a transaction occurred. And what really we need to do this evening is ask for everyone to put an end to this myth, to stop sharing it, to stop sharing it to newly arrived visitors and immigrants and school kids, and to say enough of this perpetuating of a, a racist story that uh, is an instrument of this ongoing uh, genocide. So how do we counter all of this? And, and Joe, you have always been one who has believed in expression and the arts and contemporary expression. And so through incredible works as your play, uh, Manahata, uh, Mary Catherine, and uh, Brent Michael David's Purchase of Manhattan Concert Opera, we've begun to, to counter this narrative and to, to be able to tell of a more complete, honest, truthful history. Um, and that truth element is critical for really uh, even, even uh, for a, a democracy to be healthy, for civic society to endure. The element of reconciliation begins with truth. And that truth, you still have to make sure that it, it can be heard, it can be shared, and it could be celebrated once and for all. Yeah, I, I really appreciate that. And I think, you know, when we think about stopping the myth, I think that that is deeper in the American psyche than we, than we actually realize, right? And there is this idea, you know, New York has seen, it's every single tribal nation in the United States today, right, has a historical homeland. I'm a citizen of the Cherokee Nation. I can show you exactly where my family was before our forced removal on the Trail of Tears. I can actually take you to their house because it's a museum today in Rome, Georgia. Um, not everyone has that. Uh, many many people can go to the spot where their where their relatives were before forced removal, but maybe not the building that's still there or the construction. But but our, I actually my great 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 grandfather's home is still standing there and it's a museum today. But if you stop and think for a second, so all of our homelands are sacred, any tribal nation that got removed, but there is something about Americans and the world and New York, right? It's iconic. Everyone wants to claim it. They want to have their little coffee mug with I heart New York. And I do think there's something destabilizing to a lot of Americans to actually have to divorce themselves from that myth and actually investigate and talk about the truth of what happened on this island. And we're at this moment of reckoning in so many ways, you know, again, um, with different movements, you know, the Washington football team just changed its name. But one thing that, you know, there's, there's so much from my point of view um, that is negative, that affects all Americans today that started with the genocide of the Lenape. You can look to all these different things that were done by the Dutch, the British, and then the United States, the Lenape, and now they're happening to everyone. And, you know, one of them is the taking of homes, right? Like the wall on Wall Street was built to, to by the Dutch in 1854 to forcibly, you know, prevent the Lenape from being within their own homes. And then the institutions on that wall, that's the street named after the wall in 2008, what are they doing? They're taking millions of Americans' homes. And so, you know, I just would love to hear from your perspective too, like, why does it matter to to re, to relearn the truth, and how does that impact all of us today? How how are we connected to what happened to the Lenape in the 1600s to what happens today? I, I, think, I, I think MK. The I think you 
you bring up a very vital point. I think if we as Americans embrace the truth, the founding of this country, the American dream, which, which happened right here in 1609 with the arrival of the Dutch and the beginning of capitalism and all those um, uh, outreaches of capitalism that moved in, in a Western movement across Indian country. We have to rethink our beginnings. And, and I think that's a very difficult truth. Um, if you think about what happened here, the genocide, the arrival of the Dutch West India Company in 1609, by 1630, 1630 in that, that neighborhood, 90%, 90 percent, 90 percent of the Lenape pop population was diminished. 90 percent of the people were gone by disease, by the epidemics of smallpox, by massacres. If you think about the total devastation of that kind of population loss over a very short time, you have to also accept the truth of a genocide. And I think that's very difficult for people to uh, embrace. The, uh, the only piece of paper that uh, points to a so-called purchase of Manhattan, it was a letter written by a man named Peter Scoggin, who was a colonist, and upon his arrival stated that Manhattan, he heard that Manhattan was purchased today. Um, interestingly, he also lists all of the um, resources, quote unquote, that were being uh, sent to Europe for the market, thousands of animal uh, furs, pelts, and timber, lots of timber. I'll just mention that the clear cutting that began in that time period, which if we take it to post-Dutch colonization into British and US 1800, the majority of the Northeast was clear cut for timber and for agriculture. And that so-called purchase was done by a company, the Dutch West India Company that, that was primarily a slave trading company. So we have to ask ourselves, are we going to recognize, celebrate, reference a story that for one was began by a global slave trading company, whereas perhaps a million people were enslaved. It was the most important slave trading company in the Atlantic and in the Caribbean. And its, yeah. prim and its secondary function was to counter Dutch Atlantic trade, uh, Spanish, excuse me, Spanish Atlantic trade as it was fighting a war with Spain. Within a few years, it became a company that imposed a feudal system in Lenape Hoking. So for those in the audience who don't know, Lenape Hoking is the name of the traditional territory in uh, the Catskills in the northwest into eastern Pennsylvania, east into Connecticut, south into the state of Delaware today, all of New Jersey, all of New York City. Uh, so as a company, it imposed a feudal system by which it gave away land grants to colonists, giving them titles as patroons or nobles or lords, if they brought in 50 individuals from Europe. So we have a situation of a, a company that had no right to claim land, to claim that land for land grants, then impose a feudal system that was being run by uh, uh, really through a, a slave trading operation and that through various governors uh, massacred 
and enslaved Lenape people. And the reframe that you speak of, MK, is so important because there's one perspective that hasn't really ever been considered. And, and Joe, maybe you could help us with that. Well, I, I believe that that perspective is, uh, that let, let's, let's accept the fact that all of these transactions, the, the purchase of Manhattan and the patroons and the feudal, uh, feudal system of land ownership uh, were all enacted under an alien set of laws laws that did not apply in, in Indian country. And it also is assumed, and I'm thinking right now visually uh, of the diorama that exists in the American Museum of Natural History, where you see the Lenape bearing gifts to the Dutch. The Dutch uh, have their uh, attendants with rifles and the women are in the distant background, passively tending to crops. That there's this idea, this assumption that the Lenape people were naive, they were children, they were unsophisticated, they were, they were incapable, their, their life was by chance in some kind of, of you know, virtual Eden. Uh, they were running around foraging nuts and berries and you know, they were incapable of, um, of, of understanding the sophisticated uh, Western view of life. And they, they had to be, of course, educated and tamed and assimilated. However, we had, we Lenape had our own system of laws or rules for living. And those are, I wanna share those with you tonight because I think they're very meaningful. And it's sometimes understood as spirituality when in fact, I believe they are, they are laws and rules of, of a govern, governing society. And those are, give thanks to the creator for the gifts of life. We are all relatives, respect all relations. Mother Earth gives us all we need to live, live generously because Mother Earth is generous. Honor the responsibility of caring for family. It's the responsibility of individuals and communities to maintain balance. Be thoughtful and purposeful when speaking. Honor all life and do not take life unless necessary to live. Everything in nature has a spirit and should be given thanks, gifted, and asked permission before taking. All individuals have unique gifts. Live in harmony by honoring all life. Do not take more than necessary to live. This set rules or laws have, have successfully uh, protected life and, and uh, culture for thousands of years before the arrival of the Dutch. And they continue, I offer, in our home communities today. These are not written laws. They aren't you know, on the books, but it's part of our oral um, uh, understanding, or our oral history that, that we live by today. And they have allowed us to survive and thrive and to contemporary times, despite the devastation and genocide and violence of the founding of this country. I, I love that. And thank you for sharing that, Joe, because, you know, I think as we talk about the myth and how to deconstruct the myth, um, you know, some people with with good intentions and just sort of, but all they've only had the education they've had, right? And the erasure impacts us all. And, you know, they look at deconstructing the myth of the purchase and they say, well, you know, the Indians just weren't sophisticated. The Lenape just didn't know what they were doing. And as you point out, no, the Lenape, you know, nation, all of our nations were highly sophisticated. We just didn't engage in commerce that way. We didn't believe in commodifying the land. And I, th I think... I think that's proved to be true. I mean, I think all you have to do is look around the world right now and see the problem, climate change, all the things that are actually putting all of our lives in peril because 
collectively on earth, we've decided to commodify the land instead of living in balance with the land. And we're now gonna have to get back in balance or we won't survive as a species. So as it turns out, actually <laughs> the Lenape were not intellectually inferior when they met up with the Dutch and the Dutch think they purchased the island or say they purchased the island, even though they know they didn't, but they wanted it and they decided to own it. And I think, you know, your point about laws as a lawyer, I think about the laws and yes, all of our nations had laws, but the white folks that showed up like the Dutch or the British or the Spanish said, well, your laws aren't in writing. So automatically your laws are inferior, which is also is just, I mean, is really an absurd conclusion to come to. But you've got to, if you're going to have genocide, you've got to have the laws on your side as, as the conqueror, right? And so what did the United States do? They created a system of laws that actually take the myth of the purchase of Manhattan, as well as other myths of how different tribal nations lost their land, and just put it all into this 1823 decision called Johnson v. McIntosh, where you have the Supreme Court saying, basically, when white Christians show up and find indigenous land, it becomes the land of the white Christians because natives are savage, racially inferior, they don't worship Christ, and they don't commodify the land. They're not using it to contribute to progress or, you know, uh, capitalism. And so, I mean, that's, and I'm, I'm sort of paraphrasing, but not really. The Supreme Court actually said that Native people are racially inferior savages and heathens. And it's just, it, you know, where does the Supreme Court get that idea? Well, it's the museum diorama that Joe was talking about, right? Our Supreme Court justices didn't just come up with this overnight. They are digesting all of the arts and culture and the narratives, their, their education, as well as the museum dioramas, the plays that were being done at that time. I always remind people, it is not shocking, it's no surprise to understand that Andrew Jackson won the presidency in 1828 when one of his um, main ticket items in his national campaign was eradicating the tribes and removing them in the Southeast. At the same time, in 1828, the most popular performance on Broadway was a red face play called Metamora, where a white actor put on red face and played out the, the, the you know, dying off of all Indians, right? So it's all connected. And it just brings me to one other question I really wanted to ask both you and Hadrian. I do think that, um, non-native people tend to either either they accept the myth and i'm generalizing because i know there's some non-native allies out there who get it and obviously hadrian is one of them but you know we've got many others too that are that so this is not everyone in the world who thinks this but i've you know there's sort of different ways of thinking about it right like oh you accept the myth or you don't accept the myth and but in not accepting the myth, the, I, the substitution is, well, tribal nations just weren't as economically sophisticated as the folks who came over. And we know that not to be true. I mean, we know that the reason Broadway is a street is because that was the Lenape's trading trail. And so I'd love to hear a little bit from both of you about how did the Lenape interact as as a nation with other nations in trade and commerce and diplomacy, the United States, what, what was the, one of the first things that President Washington did after they won the war against the British? They went and signed a treaty with, with the Delaware Lenape to show the rest of the world, hey, we're just as legitimate as you are. You signed a treaty with this nation. We're going to do it now, too. So I, I, I know that was a very long-winded uh, introduction to a question, but I'd love to hear your reactions to that. Well, you know, I have really enjoyed exploring more thoroughly the agricultural practices that were in place here on the island, uh, pre-contact. And, uh, you know, we have, we have evidence, we have written record of cultivated fruit trees that were along the Hudson River uh, that, that were being cultivated, uh, the, the beach plum, uh, and, and the indigenous crab apple, but also there were peach orchards here pre-contact. And what does that tell us? They're not indigenous, but they were brought here to this land by the Spanish pre-contact. So we know that there was a great deal of exchange and trade going on, people visiting, uh, visiting in the true sense of visiting, not corporations that landed with muscle, but that were coming and going throughout uh, 
uh, these early, early periods. And there was trade happening. There were extensive trade uh, routes and exchange. This was a thriving, successful uh, economy. It just was not the economy of Europe. It was different and it was built on respect and relationships, which is a totally different perspective. Uh, that's how I see it. Geographically, when you look at the Delaware River, the Hudson River, the Connecticut River, these three arteries are these life arteries that today we understand as economy and communication and trade and society, but really this incredibly um, powerful means of, of life-sustaining processes that have always been here and were radically disrupted by uh, the beginnings of colonization, settler colonialism in 1609. So again, it's 95% destruction of a homeland, the enormous amounts of pollution of drinking water, this overhunting, uh, this fencing, this really uh, collapse that was um, quickly accelerated through, as Joe mentioned, uh, measles and sp smallpox and influenza that uh, really happened in, in one sort of motion along with this land grabbing through, you know, land grants. Um, and to your point, uh, MK, the, the, uh, the paper trail of um, through the Charter of Freedoms and Exemptions, the Dutch West India Company uh, wanted some kind of paper deed which means absolutely nothing, but somehow satisfies those laws right. of that invasive colony, but not the laws of this land. And this is the reframing that is so needed today. Yeah, you know, I, um, it's interesting because once you educate yourself and, you know, I, I grew up in Oklahoma and I didn't even really understand the full history of it until I moved to Manhattan and lived there for several years. And you see, you see traces of it everywhere, right? There's a street named Pearl Street, right? right. Named for the place where, I mean, Joe, you can explain it better than I can. There's, but you know, Peter Steisman is one of the directors of the Dutch West India Company that perpetrated some of these horrific atrocities against the Lenape. And there's all these things named after him, right? right. And there's all these things named after Peter Minuet. And there are these hints of things that got names like the Broadway, which was their trading, Lenape trading trail that's now Broadway. But what, what, how do both of you see, what is your vision for, you know, I know the Lenape Center has a mission and you're working on it, but what would it look like for, for Manhattan to more clearly show whether, you know, I, I, I don't just mean to make it about the names of streets, but what are you interested in seeing happen in the near term to bring about that visibility and to combat the erasure to so people can't just live in Manhattan and ignore the fact of, of history and that the Lenape are still here today? Uh, MK, what I would like to see happen here in the city, and because when I walk about on the streets here, like you mentioned, there's all of these signals of, of a very difficult, painful beginning. Uh, it's here, it's, it's undeniable, you, you're confronted by it. So I would like to see our, our, our cultural, art and cultural institutions, our universities open their doors to Lenape people and invite them home, bring them back to somehow, express them their creativity, express their 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 vision, express their life ways in the homeland. Uh, and and of course, that's not what everyone wants to do. But for those who really are looking and seeking for new opportunities to expand their expression, this is the cultural center 
I would say of the world. I mean, everything happens here in New York City. So if, if the institutions that have benefited and profited from being here in Lenape Hawking, on this soil, our ancestral land, could begin to open their doors in, in, in ways to invite Lenape people home. That would be, that would be, that would thrill me beyond all, all extremes. That would be the dream that I would hold close to my heart. I love that. And I just got chills when you said that, because, you know, instead of a land, I mean, and land acknowledgement and actually inviting Lenape artists, leaders, language speakers, culture bearers, wow. you know, everyone home. I, that is so, so, so powerful. Um, Hadrian, any final thoughts? I think we're um, about to wrap up the dialogue here, but any final thoughts from you? I would love to see the, the city do its part to realize that there are institutions as the Brooklyn Public Library who have stepped up, who have truly partnered, who have uh, enabled for a platform for community members to express themselves and to educate the public. It's a civic duty. And I'd love to see more from the city as far as that's concerned, because if any city can and should do it, should be this one. I couldn't agree more. And I, I just wanna stop and acknowledge what the Brooklyn Public Library is doing here because I know when I was living in Manhattan in 2010 um, and first met you all and Curtis and heard about your efforts and wanted to support them, it was really hard to find any institution in the entire city that would even talk to you all, like yes. would even acknowledge that the Lenape once existed and lived and and this was their homeland and and, or, and still exists today. And, and so just how far we've come and it's sort of, you know, frustrating that other institutions in New York haven't come around yet. But uh, I mean, some some appreciation tonight for Brooklyn Public Library for for doing this and doing this hard work and for inviting the Lenape Center in and Joe and other Lenape folks. You know, I know there have been other Lenape folks involved in different talks and discussions and 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 the you know the different uh, works that the, the Brooklyn Public Library is featuring and, and doing around all of this. Um, I think someone put a link to the the gallery in the chat earlier for everyone. Um, but uh, the project that the Brooklyn Public Library has undertaken. So just, yeah, just wanted to acknowledge what a long journey it's been just to get to this point. <laughs> um, I think uh, now, Joel, I'm not sure, is it time to, to bring Stuart into the conversation? Absolutely. Okay, great. I'll let you. I'll let you go ahead and do that. Stuart, do you want to come back in and introduce your film? Can you hear me? Yes. Um, should I speak, Mary Catherine? Yeah, so I, and I, I apologize for, <laughs> I wasn't sure if Joel was going to introduce you, but I will just, uh, I will let you introduce your film, of course, but I will say um, as someone who worked with you on it, and I know you worked very closely with Lenape Center and, uh, and actually went out and retraced what many Lenape have called the Trail of Broken Treaties, we didn't get into that tonight, but um, you know, many of our tribal nations were forcibly removed. The Lenape were forcibly removed countless times, repeated times by various conquering, conquering nations and to various territories. And I know you went and, and visited, uh, you know, there's sort of a diaspora today of the Lenape who are, are you know, a few different tribal nations in the United States and have put together a very compelling film that I think we're about to share. So I will turn it over to you to introduce it. And um, thank you so much for, for being here with us tonight and for letting us all be a part of your film. Um, thank you. Uh, first, I, I just want to say it's a, it's a very high honor for me to share this Zoom link with, with you and Joe and Hadrian. 
um, I, I, uh, your work is uh, amazing and uh, everybody should know what you guys are doing. Um, Mary Catherine said she didn't understand a lot of the story of the Lenape until she moved to New York. I didn't understand it until I moved away from New York. Um, I've, I work in Indian country, I'm a reporter. I moved to Minneapolis and uh, thought, well, here's a whole new part of the country for me. I should look around and see and meet the indigenous people of this region. And I found uh, in Wisconsin, New Yorkers. Um, and uh, so it was a, a really late in life uh, awakening for me that, uh, that the original New Yorkers that I always considered myself a New Yorker, having grown up in the city, um, actually lived in uh, Wisconsin and Oklahoma and Ontario. Um, and in my work, I knew that, that I came to understand that it's a moral imperative for this country to return land to indigenous stewardship. Um, and it's also clear that any viable strategy for uh, navigating the climate crisis involves returning land to indigenous stewardship. Um, so then I thought, how can I uh, champion this idea, these ideas? And I thought, New York City and take it to my hometown, to the country's financial and media capital um, and see if we can promote Joe's wonderful vision for having the city open its arms and welcome uh, its original inhabitants home, that that would be a very, very powerful example to set for the rest of the country. Um, I started on the project and I had the incredible luck of meeting uh, all of the panelists here and Curtis uh, and others. And um, uh, here's my here's my my project. This country can do anything it really wants. Beat the Brits, land on the moon, split the atom. How about finally making friends with the native peoples it tried so hard to vanquish? It'll be a big job, so let's call it the Manhattan Project after Manhattan's original name. It'll take some rethinking, so let's kick off the erase the erasure effort in New York because, well, New York is the center of the universe. Don't believe me? Just ask a New Yorker. They'll tell you. They'll also tell you what to put on a bagel. With a schmear, don't toast it. How to eat pizza and where to get I'll off. Go through the park here. And even if they're wrong, they'll tell you how much of a real New Yorker they are. I know. I'm a New Yorker. I even went to collegiate school founded by the Dutch in 1628 in New Amsterdam before there even was a New York. We were the Dutchmen and we were the original New Yorkers. Or were we? Long before Europeans arrived, the Lenape Indians thrived in the land known as Lenape Hoking that today runs from Philadelphia up to and beyond New York City. It included two major river valleys, the Hudson River Valley and the Delaware River Valley. They were very rich in the bounty of the waters and the forest for their sustenance. And the Lenape people were more than just hunters and gatherers. They had agriculture. And they were respected. The Lenape were indeed very capable of being fierce warriors, but they were really known among their neighboring tribes as Mahumsak, the grandfathers. They were considered to be the wise ones and their elder leadership was often called upon to mediate peace. So that's how important and distinctive the Lenape were preceding colonial contact. But today in New York, the Lenape are all but invisible. Where did they go? Those that weren't killed were moved away, far away. First by the Dutch, who built a wall, that became Wall Street, around their colony to keep the Lenape out. Then by the British, and then the Americans. 
all under moral cover from the church which decreed, You go to these lands, you take dominion over these lands and the savages that live on the land, and you are to convert those savage to savages to Christianity. Those that will not convert, you kill them. Or just force them out. The Lenape, along with many other Native nations on the East Coast, were moved several times before finally having a home to themselves. So the move started, you know, you're in Lenape Hoking, which is parts of New York, Pennsylvania, New Jersey, and then they're shifted westward as ex- colonial expansion starts to happen more. Today's Lenape descendants live primarily on five reservations in Ontario, Wisconsin, and Oklahoma under names given them by federal governments, including Muncie, Moravian, and Delaware. The people of Lenape Haki, which includes New York and New York City, need to know that the Lenape people continue and are in thriving communities. The largest of which is in Bartlesville, Oklahoma, on the Delaware Tribe of Indians Reservation. Delaware is a name that was given to Lenape people by Europeans. It is not who we are. We are known as Delaware today. We are Lenape. With a dream of returning to Lenape Hoking. People don't realize how significant those homelands still are to us. There's a reason why the East Coast calls you home because it is home. There's a reason why when you are in New York, while you're there, you feel a sense of peace because that's home. Okay, so now that we know this, what are we gonna do? We're gonna build a center. An idea that was launched virtually more than a decade ago. Lenape Center was founded in 2009 in response to what we felt and experienced and saw as our complete erasure from this land, our ancestral land. Our first decade of existence in Lenape Center has been to focus on cultural things, programming as opposed to having a building. But now is the time when we're thinking about having a place where people can come visit and come stay and actually see the homeland and experience the homeland. The Lenape Center founders today are launching a fundraising campaign to build a physical center in Lenape Hoking. So here we are in the center, the heart of Manhattan. We're standing on this concrete among all these buildings. This is Lenape Hoking. Our ancestors are still here. By going back, we combat the erasure of the Lenape because the Lenape, until just fairly recently, were still kind of in the history books. Or sometimes not. Here's the history textbook from when I was in school. There's no mention of the Lenape. But there is this. Praise for the Dutch for buying Manhattan from the Indians. Some things are beginning to change. Collegiate school students now study the Lenape, and Columbia University and the Metropolitan Museum of Art have installed plaques stating they sit on Lenape homeland. But for decades, the only hints of the Lenape found in Manhattan were on the seal of the city and on two monuments to the Dutch transaction, one on the southern tip of the island in Battery Park and the other way up north in Inwood Hill Park. So as we're coming along the pathway in Inwood Hill Park, we come upon this plaque, which according to legend, is the actual place of the mythical purchase of Manhattan, 1626 for 60 guilders. There is, of course, a problem with that narrative. Manhattan, as it was known, was not sold to the Dutch. It's a mythical purchase. The purchase of Manhattan is a myth. A land grab. Total mythology. This is a myth, a magical recreation for the erasure of our people. It just plain couldn't have happened for at least two reasons. First, the Lenape had no concept of land ownership. How do you own the earth with its great spirit power? How do you own the sky? How do you own the air? How do you own the waters? You don't. And second, the Dutch struck the deal with Lenape men who didn't have the authority. In Lenape Hoking, It was the women who made the big decisions. It's part of the big lie. And if you you lie enough 
and in a big enough way, it becomes believable. The idea of a purchase of land was carefully orchestrated into the psyche of the American public, and it has continued for generations until today. Along with other degradations, after successfully taking Native land, the United States took aim at Native culture. Under policies of forced assimilation from the 19th century to the 1970s, Native children were taken en masse to boarding schools and forbidden to speak their language or celebrate their heritage. It was nearly the death blow for many tribal cultures, including the Lenape. My relatives didn't want to be Native in the America that they grew up in. I mean, they were actually taught not to practice their culture, uh, to fit in. Their uh, culture was stripped away from them in, in boarding schools. But the last embers never went out. I knew when I had children that I wanted to be able to have my kids grow up to be around the drum, to be around the culture, to be around the people. And Kayla is a product of that. I am Lenape. I am indigenous. So that means to me that everything that has to do with whatever I do, whether it's the clothes that I wear, everything, it gets indigenized. So I just bring all of those attributes into all of my life. I'm very, very appreciative because my, even my own mother did not grow up with those ways. I think it is a centering, a self-centering thing. When I don't know what to do, I go and I dance and I, it just clears my mind. And I'm uh, thankful for that because I would not be the person that I am today without my culture. <laughs> So the Dutch West India Company built a wall, which is Wall Street, for the purpose of keeping Lenape people out. That was just the beginning. Next came the smallpox. There was disease. There was massacres. That didn't work. So let's Christianize them. That didn't work. Let's put them in boarding school. That didn't work. Let's remove them to this isolated, desolate place called Indian Territory, that didn't work. We continue our language, our culture. We live and thrive today. With a vision to rebuild a home for Lenape descendants in Lenape Hoking, a modern center on Manhattan, the very island where Europeans first built a wall to keep the Lenape at bay, a center that's close to the ancestors' forest with its arrow-straight tulip trees used to make dugout canoes and close to the waters that served as food sources and trade routes. A Lenape cultural center built in the one place that checks all those boxes. And the last wild stand of forest on Manhattan, in Inwood Hill Park, on the very northern tip of the island. The story of the Lenape is a complex story. It's a story of forced removal, forced migration. It's a story of diasporic communities that have been pushed west far from the homeland. It is a story that has yet to be fully told and understood by the American people. It is part of our mission at Lenape Center to educate all of this country on the beginnings of the United States of America. I think it's 
an exciting time in the United States. In the last few years, we've seen the first Native women ever elected to the U.S. Congress. We now have the first ever Native Secretary of the Department of Interior. We're seeing a lot of firsts in this country. And I hope that with those firsts will also come erasure of some of the invisibility that Native peoples have had in their own homelands. So for New York to recognize the Lenape and to honor their historic relationship with the Lenape and to acknowledge that the Lenape are still here today. They might be in Oklahoma in the, as the Delaware tribe in Bartlesville and the Delaware nation in Anadarko, but they were not completely erased and that there is a relationship of respect to be upheld there. I think that will benefit all Americans because no matter where you're living in the United States, you're living on the historic homelands of a tribal nation. And restoring that respectful relationship will benefit everyone, not just the tribal nations whose homelands you live on. All right. Um, thank you, Stuart. What an incredible, incredible film. I get chills just watching it. Um, I love seeing Curtis's granddaughter on there. <laughs> so amazing. Um, and so amazing to see everyone on there. Um, so we have a lot of questions in the q and I think we go for just about another 15, 12, 15 minutes. So I'd like to present some of the questions that panelists, or I'm sorry, that attendees have been asking to the panelists. There are a lot, so we're unfortunately not gonna be able to get to all of them. But I will take one question that we got from Anna, and I'm, I'm sending this out to Stuart, Joe, or, or um, Hadrian. Anna says, what policy level suggestions do the panelists have for actively rewriting the narrative about New York City's origin story and our origin story as a country? Pretty big question, but what policy level suggestions do you all have? Joe, that's yours. <laughs> well, thank you, Stuart. Um, you know, in terms of policy, uh, I think, uh, I'd like to see the uh, city of New York make uh, an official re uh, recognition of the Lenape ancestral uh, homeland uh, through a, a kind of proclamation. Uh, I'd like to see the city of New York begin to support in very direct ways uh, the the beginning of the the uh, to make available uh, the uh, resources within the city to the Lenape nations in the diaspora. I love that. We got a very specific question as well from this is from someone who's anonymous. They wrote. There is a plaque in Inwood Hill Park about the selling of Manhattan Island. Is there any effort to have that removed and or revised? Anyone can answer that. Uh, that's a good question for Joe because I asked him that same question. Um, should we remove those and replace them? And he had, uh, he had a very thoughtful answer. Well, you know, I, I think uh, removing the plaque is not enough. I think uh, a broader discussion around this plaque is the uh, proper approach. I, I don't. I think it's a point of of entry into a, a broader conversation. I think I think plaques such as the one in in Woodhill Park can be used, utilized effectively for a further discussion. And in other words, removing the plaque 
does not remove the history. Yeah, that's good. I appreciate that. Uh, this is a question that I, I love. Um, please explain more about the matriarchal decision-making. Probably a question for you too, Joe, but Stuart and Hadrian, feel free to jump in. But what, what, what does it mean that women made the decisions? Well, in, in our society, and it's true for many uh, other uh, nations, uh, women have a very honored and special place in, in, in the society. Um, they have uh, decision-making powers, political powers. Uh, women and elders really call the shots, so to speak, within a tribal nation. And it's, that's, that would be true for Lenape. I mean, as to refer back to the diorama at the American History Museum, Natural History Museum, you know, women, uh, Lenape women are not passive. They are not uh, in the background. Uh, they, they have important voices and important uh, uh, positions within, within the tribal nation. You know, and I think that's true for so many of our tribal nations. You know, I know at Cherokee Nation, um, you know, your clan, your identity is based on your mother, whereas in sort of American society, right, you get your last name from your father, and that's the kind of family lineage you trace uh, within Cherokee society, it's through your mother, and we had a specific position on our, our council for our nation, and that was the beloved woman, and the beloved woman, would it was a designated spot for a woman, and if the men in the council voted to go to war, the beloved woman had a veto. She could always just by herself veto uh, the men deciding to go to war. And so you just think about, you know, we have all these conversations today about what gender equality means. And of course you have to unpack that within the context of gender identity, but, you know, within our worlds, historically pre-contact and, you know, traditional societies, right? It was, it was more about balance and there were different roles but it wasn't, there wasn't this sense of a hierarchy of, well, this is, this person has more power and is better because they're in, you know, they have this role and this person has this role and it's not valued as much, right? Everything was sort of valued and equally in a way, even though there might be different roles. Um, and I think that's always important to point out too. Um, let's see, I'm just going through some of the questions that are, that are speaking to me. Uh, so Louise writes, hi, thank you for this fascinating discussion. You mentioned some of the local fauna that used to be grown on Lenape Hawking. Do you have any interest in bringing back some of these species on Manhattan? A great question. And um, we in fact do, and we have an upcoming program with Brooklyn Public Library, the Greenpoint Branch. In fact, indigenous fruit trees, the uh, beach plum uh, and others were just delivered this week to the rooftop terrace. So be sure and watch the website or track the website for the upcoming program. Those trees, the saplings that are now installed as part of the exhibition uh, will be during the month of June moved for permanent planning to Prospect Park. So there is a return of the, um, the flora of Lenape Hoking to the ancestral land as well as the people. I love that. I, I love that. Um, this is a question from Grace. What are the long-term goals for the Lenape Center and how can current NYC residents help you realize them? Adrian, help me out on that. Long-term goals. Long-term goal, um, I think would be really wonderful to have uh, a space, our own space that we can utilize to enhance the platform and, and enable for people to express themselves, to come home, to, uh, to uh, come together. Um, really this, um, this idea of, of the center, the, the uh, you know, realities that we've, we've been focusing on, on the programs and we haven't uh, 
up until now uh, worried so much about the, the one physical space. Um, and really the positive to that is that it's, it's forced us to really have these, some wonderful partnerships as with the Brooklyn Public Library in order to make use of, of support and, and space. Uh, but long-term, uh, uh, you know, having a place that uh, would be dedicated for that purpose that could live on through generations, that would be really wonderful. Yeah. Just really quickly, if, if someone wanted to donate to the Lenape Center's effort, um, is there a link on your website that lets people do that? Or what's the, how is the best way for people to do that? Our, our website does have a link for donations. Um, and that goes to the uh, uh, New York Foundation for the Arts uh, website donation link. Okay, great. So people can get involved in helping the Lenape Center obtain a physical location within their ancestral homeland. And how powerful would that be? Um, Joe, what, did you have anything to add to that? Well, I'm, I'm still thinking about the flora and fauna because of <laughs> a great passion of mine. And, and I want to quickly mention that we have uh, an ongoing, actually we're in our third growing season, partnership with Farm Hub in the Hudson uh, River Valley, where we are growing uh, ancestral Lenape corn and beans again in the homeland. Um, with the purpose of having enough uh, uh, product from those uh, seasons that we can begin to return those seeds uh, to the home communities. Wow, that's amazing. And, you know, going back to this conversation we had earlier before watching the film of just so, sort of how, you know, it's, it's so common today for um, to look back on Native societies or, or governments and say, they weren't sophisticated, but most of what we eat in the United States today, we wouldn't be able to eat if natives hadn't cultivated it first, right? I mean, right. you think about corn, you think about beans, you think about chocolate, you think about all these things were, were indigenous crops that indigenous people cultivated for, I don't know how many hundreds or thousands of years, right? Until Europeans showed up and, and just sort of remembering that and then the fact that you all are gonna to try to bring, but then of course, the, you know, with all the GMO and all the ways in which these crops have been changed, going back to those original seeds and those original crops is such a, a powerful thing to be doing. You talk about reclaiming not just the land, but the, the plants that you cultivated on that land is so, so exciting. Yeah, to reclaim the food ways uh, on, yeah. the, on yep. the ancestral land. And, and the, the seeds for the uh, Lenape corn were actually passed through generations of the Nora Thompson Dean family wow. all the way to Oklahoma. And upon her death in 1984, they were assigned to a seed bank for safekeeping. And three years ago, we were able to access those seeds and bring them home. So wow. these actions uh, are powerful. They're also emotional. They, they actually, I mean, they really, you know, strike you at the core. And, and this is the work that we are dedicated and committed to doing today. It's, 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 uh, it's our passion. So we yeah. have everyone's participation. Thanks, special thanks to Stuart for the film. Uh, that was mm -hmm. a great experience all during COVID. We yeah. were out there, um, amazing work. And we so appreciate that. Yes, I think uh, it's unfortunately that time of night where it's time for us to end the discussion, but um, hopefully folks will continue these efforts and you know, connect with the Lenape Center, support their efforts. Um, some of the questions that we didn't get to asked about how to educate children about these issues. I think Stuart's film is a great starting point, right? right. Um, and yeah. I'm Stuart, yeah, go ahead. Can I make just one one point? I, I, I want to just say that it's, I think it's important for the broader community to realize that this is a two-way street. Um, that the wall that went up on Wall Street uh, kept out some wonderful things that can help us going forward. As Joe mentioned, respect the creator. We are all related. 
Mother Earth gives us all, honor the family, maintain balance. Those are values that I would like to see come back to Manhattan. I love that. I love that. And just thank you so much, Stuart, for your film. I, I know that was really um, a lot of work, but came together so beautifully and so, so powerful to see so many amazing Lenape folks from the diaspora all talking about what it means to come home and, and to be recognized and seen in their own home instead of erased. Uh, such a powerful powerful moment we're living in where finally after hundreds of years of genocide, this is now possible. And that everyone in New York can have a hand in it and can be a part of getting rid of this erasure and welcoming the Lenape back to their ancestral homeland. So I just wanna thank Stuart, I wanna thank Joe and Hadrian for everything you're doing with Lenape Center. It is such incredible work. And to the Brooklyn Public Library for inviting us here for this conversation tonight and for creating this space. And I know this talk is over, but there'll be many more discussions to have as we continue to wel welcome the Lenape home to their ancestral homeland. Yes. And I want to thank you, Mary Catherine, and all of you for this incredible conversation. I'm Marcia Eli. Um, I also am part of the Brooklyn Public Library's BPL Presents team with Joel and the Center for History. I want to let everybody watching know that this program has been recorded and it will be posted tomorrow on the Center for Brooklyn History's YouTube page. Um, and I want to tell you just a few of the other things that are part of our incredibly meaningful partnership with the Lenape Center. There is an exhibit at the Greenwood Branch, curated by Joe, um, uh, which is open until April 30th, and it's something well worth going to that beautiful branch to see. Um, we have many other programs coming down the pike, um, some of them um, have been talked about in this in this program soon um brent michael davids who you saw uh in the film and is an, is a co-director of the lenape center um will be speaking about his music and we'll be hearing his music um, we have indigenous poetry coming up we have programs as joe mentioned about returning lenape seeds to the homeland through the seed rematriation um, garden um, and we are working on an anthology um, that will be printed um, with essays from all of the speakers uh, uh, that you've seen who have contributed one way or another to this anthology and many more. Um, so in the chat is a link to, uh, to a way to explore the website parts uh, from the Brooklyn Public Library's website that relate to the Lenape Hoking Ho uh, and Lenape Center partnership. And I encourage you all to explore those and to please come and, and join us for some of these programs that are coming up. They're all going to be just as wonderful. Thank you all so much, everybody. I hope you have a, a great night. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you.